All right. Well, everyone, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we're so excited that we have Kaylin here to do this program on Agnes, Agnes Wright Spring. Um, now we'll be starting the program in just a moment, um, but welcome. I am Mike Erickson and I work at the Center for Colorado Women's History. Today I'm joined by my colleague Kat Jensen, who is also on video here, um, who will be helping us with any technical issues. If you've never been before, the Center for Colorado Women's History at the Byers Evans House was home to inspiring women since 1883. This Italian style Victorian house was built for William and Elizabeth Byers in 1883. After 1889, the Evans resided in the home until 1981. Through their involvement in women's clubs, the women of 13th Den Bannock contributed to civic and charitable organizations in early Denver. So now, with this knowledge of that, the Center for Colorado Women's History at the Byers Evans House is a space for dialogue that generate new knowledge and perspective of women's role in history within Colorado and beyond. So we are happy that we could reach you online. And please note that we are going to be open Friday through Sunday, starting at 1130 as of yesterday. So please find time to visit us if you'd like. But before we get started, and in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archaeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. Now today, we're so happy to have a fellow of the Center for Colorado's History in 2019, Kaylin Mercury. Kaylin Mercury was the former fall fellow with us. She is now the outreach coordinator for the Louisville uh, Historical Museum. She is a recent graduate of the University of Colorado Denver, where she earned a Master of Public or a Master of Arts in Public History. So thank you so much, Kaylin, um, and we're so excited to hear about this. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thank you all for having me and welcome. Before we get started, we just thought it would be appropriate to contextualize where we are in this moment. And so we just put together a brief history of Juneteenth, which we celebrated yesterday for anyone who is unaware or does not know the background of that celebration. And then also we want to recognize that today's talk will discuss race and gender in the context of accessing educational resources and general resources and recognizes the complex historical layers of the national discussions. And so this talk will be recorded if anyone would like to uh, return to that slide. So jumping right in, Today, I am here to talk to you about Agnes Bright Spring. She is the first female state historian of Colorado, as well as the first female to do a lot of things. And so I'm going to give you a brief history of her life today, and I um, hope to answer any questions you have at the end. So before we get started, as Mike said, I was a fall fellow, and I just want to give some background to the project and how it came about. So Agnes Bright Spring's life includes a lot of different states, different people, different stories, and she moved around a lot. And so naturally there's a lot of confusion about when she was where and when she was doing what. And so even at historical, repo uh, historical repositories, there can be confusion. And at History Colorado, there was confusion about when she worked on the Colorado Magazine, which is now Colorado Heritage. And so that question popped up while I was a grad student. And um, then as Agnes was kind of floating around in my world and being mentioned to me in different places, she kept popping up in my research. And I just at some point couldn't ignore her and I decided to study her for my thesis. And this fall fellowship was a great way to take that research off the page and give it to people in a different format like this and be able to share what I've learned. And additionally, the women's suffrage centennial provided an opening for Agnes' story because, as you'll learn, she is connected to the suffrage movement and it's been a great way to tie her in with this centennial that we are celebrating. So that's some background on the project. And to get started, Agnes Wright Spring was born in 1894 in Delta, Colorado. She was born to Gordon and Myra Wright, who you see on the right side of your screen. She was born uh, in Delta, Colorado, but in 1903, her family moved to Little Laramie, Wyoming, where they owned a stagecoach stop, which is at the top left of your screen, that little tiny log house. 
Eventually they expanded that into a 10 room log house where they were able to have boarders stay um, who were traveling through Stagecoach throughout the country. And those travelers are the reason why Agnes got started as a writer and as a story sharer. She was fascinated by the people who would come through her parents' stagecoach stop. They would always tell of their adventures and their troubles along the way. And Agnes started writing them down in a journal. And from a young age, Agnes was very curious and she was literate early on. And at the age of just 15, sorry, in 1909, she went to the University of Wyoming where she studied engineering. Big surprise there. Everyone thought she was gonna be a writer at first, but then she fell in love with becoming a land surveyor and with cartography. And so she really wanted to study engineering and she was admitted into an engineering class and was the first woman to do so at the University of Wyoming. And this kind of started a trend for us at the University of Wyoming and throughout her life of being the first woman to do a few things. So as an engineering student, Agnes was teased by all of her male colleagues and fellow students. She uh, had a mishap on her first time out on field work where she realized that her compass was just spinning. And instead of giving in to being tortured and teased, Agnes persevered and eventually figured out that it was the metal caging of her skirt that was causing her compass to spin in circles. And she was nicknamed Old Ironsides and instead of letting, internalizing that and making that a negative thing, I eventually turned it into a very positive thing and became friends with all of her uh, male colleagues along the way, um, which just shows her perseverance throughout that process. So she studied engineering and was the first female to do so. At the University of Wyoming, she was also the first female to be the editor of the Wyoming student publication, which is oddly enough called the Wyoming student. And, um, and on top of those ventures, she also worked for the university's library. And working at the library is an important jumping off part for her life because she was mentored by Grace Raymond Hebert, who was a suffragist and later a professor at the University of Wyoming, who would connect her really important things in her life later on. So from an early age, Agnes was a go-getter. And this would be a continual theme throughout her life. After graduation in 1913, Agnes's connection with the library system landed her a job as the assistant librarian of the Supreme Court Library. And I just note this because she made some very important connections while working in Cheyenne, Wyoming at this library. She became friends with Governor Carey and his wife, Julia, and more importantly, Julia, because Julia kind of took Agnes under her wing and helped her received the funding so that she could attend graduate school. So in 1916, Agnes packed her bags and moved to New York City to attend the Pulitzer School of Journalism uh, at Columbia University. And so Agnes left the West and moved to New York. While at Columbia, the first thing Agnes did was to volunteer with the suffrage movement. And a little side note and context here, yes, Agnes already had the right to vote because she was born in Colorado and raised in Wyoming and became a voting age in Wyoming. And women in the West, many of them already had the right to vote. But in New York, women did not receive the right to vote until 1917. So when Agnes arrived in 1916, it was like the epicenter of the movement for New York. And they were pushing hard. And so Agnes jumped right in using her connection with Grace Raymond Hayward back in Wyoming and became a, an advocate for the movement. And in between her classes, her grad classes, Agnes would canvas neighborhoods with a partner. She never went alone. She would canvas neighborhoods with a partner, knocking on doors, asking people to sign petitions, and handing out pamphlets for the movement. Now here, I want to pause and tell a couple of stories because this was really formative for Agnes. She grew up in the West where she was told that she was the equal of a man in many, many, many ways, especially legally. When she got to New York, it was like eye-opening for her that these women did not have this basic right. And so not only was she in volunteer, but she was also awakening to this calling that would, she would follow for the rest of her life. And so while a volunteer, she experienced things, different reactions to women's equality that she had never seen before. Namely, at one point, 
when she was going around with a partner who was also from Wyoming, uh, she was stamped on and then the door was slammed in her face. And the woman who slammed the door shouted, I hope you never get the vote. To which Agnes replied, I already have the vote. I'm from Wyoming and so is she. And the story, they just kind of chuckled at it. But that stalwart well, being against the movement so hard really sat with Agnes in such a negative way. And it, it burned a fire in her and, um, and lit that spark. So that was something that she would always go back to, especially when she was giving a, a talk to young girls later on in her life. That was a story she would always tell. It's the turning point in her story. The next experience that I want to share with you is that Agnes used that fire to want to write about the movement. Through grad school and through her writing, she wanted to benefit the suffrage movement. In order to do so, she wanted to learn more about the legal side of things. And so she wanted to audit, not attend, not take, but audit a constitutional law class. And so with this goal in mind, Agnes went to the Dean of Students office where she was going to make her case and ask to audit this class. Even the women at the time were not allowed to take law classes. She was very rudely shut down through a series of events that I will now uh, describe to you. Agnes, went and sat in the dean's office in the waiting room, told the assistant why she was there, and then because she didn't have an appointment, she waited all day, watching student after student go through the door. At the end of the day, the assistant came around from the desk and told her that the dean would not see her and to try again. And so Agnes did. Day after day, she came back, sat in the same waiting room, even with an appointment. She was not seen. Until eventually, Agnes got very angry and demanded to be seen marched herself into the dean's office and made her case, to which he was really calm, but also very obstinate and said, we're not to that point, women cannot even audit this class. And so Agnes left Columbia very upset at the state of things. She would mention later in her life that she wished she had screamed back at him, I'm going back to the West where they treat women the same as men. And that's really what she thought of the West. She thought of it as an equal place for men and women. And she ended up leaving New York and leaving the University of Columbia without finishing grad school because she was so serious about this new position that she had found in her life, this new mission for equality. So I'm going back to the West where they treat men the same as women or women the same as men. Upon returning to the West in 1917, Agnes was appointed as the state librarian for Wyoming. And here she took her mission into um, including new materials for the library, but her budget was really small. And then to make matters different, in 1918 when the, um, when the United States entered World War I, the state of Wyoming decided that they wanted to add the position of state historian to Wyoming. And they thought it made logical sense to add that position on to the state librarian at the time. And so Agnes became state librarian and state historian at the exact same time. And she saddled this dual position and was not given an increased budget. Now, at that time, she didn't have much say so in that position. Later on down the road, state historians kind of shifted and had a little bit more say. Um, but at this time, she was kind of saddled with this responsibility. And her responsibility as Wyoming State Historian was just to keep track of uh, Wyoming servicemen who were serving in World War I. And so she saddled these positions together and then on top of that was also appointed as the director of uh, a library war services. So as you can see on the right side of your screen, um, you've got a publication that Agnes actually put out calling for people to donate books to servicemen who were serving overseas in World War I. So she took on all three of these positions and lost her way for a little bit with her mission because she didn't have a lot of say so in what she was doing. Um, but she also realized the bubble that she was placed in and started to fight back. In 1919, Agnes wrote the bill that would later be added to the legislation separating the state librarian from the state historian in Wyoming um, that would give them separate budgets and make them able to do their own programming um, and so that whoever was the state historian down the road would have a little bit more flexibility with uh, their subject matter. And so she did realize that bubble and start to fight back, but while she was state librarian and state historian, it was 
pretty much a tight restrictions around her. Um, so Agnes ended up leaving those positions to marry Archie T. Spring or Archer T. Spring in 1920. And he was a geologist from Boston and she called him the East to her West. She was smitten um, and she loved the life that he wanted. He had been a geologist who worked all through Latin America, living in different conditions every single year. And he was longing for a desk job of all things. He wanted a quiet life and that's what she wanted too. And so they got married and they moved to Denver, Colorado where uh, Archie had secured a job. And so when they moved back to Denver, Agnes was technically unemployed, but she turned her sights to becoming an author, to fulfilling those dreams of writing that had been sparked within her at a young age. And you'll notice that Agnes kind of goes through these phases. She started off loving writing, and then she wanted to be a land surveyor, and then her connection to the library got her to work in libraries. And so she was just following opportunity after opportunity, but she would eventually find her way back to this love of writing through grad school, and then also through this connection to history that she had after becoming the state historian in Wyoming. And so her subject matter was the West, was explorers and early routes of the West, she loved to tell stories from the first person's perspective or a family member's perspective. So she did in-person interviews as much as possible. And so the 1920s really were a turning, another turning point for Agnes in her career-wise as she started to focus on writing more. And so these are some of her texts. Um, this is only a few. There are over 22 books that she would eventually publish throughout her life. Um, so her subject matter was definitely the West, and she would be evolving as a writer over time, as we'll get to later. It's the fire that was lit within her in New York would catch up to her writing career eventually. Her writing career was slowed down in the 1930s because of the Great Depression. When literary works and publishing houses were not doing so well, Agnes was out of work and she started to seek other opportunities. In 1935, the Works Progress Administration was created and underneath the WPA or the Works Progress Administration was the Federal Writers Project. The Federal Writers Project was put in place to help struggling writers and publishing houses during the time. And there were many other projects like it to help struggling actors and other people in other career uh, paths. And so this was not a unique program, but it was unique to writers and it um, created an opportunity for Agnes. So in 1935, Agnes and Archie were still living in Colorado and Agnes was out of work. And that's when she got a call out of the blue from Dr. Leroy Hafen, who was a well-known historian in Colorado at the time. And he had been appointed the director of the Federal Writers Project office in Colorado. Each state would have their own office for the Federal Writers Project and within that office would have an appointed director. So Dr. Hafen was the director of the Colorado Federal Writers Project and it was his job to assemble a team of writers and researchers to write guidebooks to his state and, and publish them to put writers to work, to put researchers to work, but also to increase and hopefully as the Writers Project hoped to increase tourism and get, help the nation get past the Great Depression. So out of the blue, Dr. Hafen calls Agnes Wrightspring up and he says, I've been looking at your works. I've recognized your, uh, your work ethic and your research. It's flawless. We would love to have you on our team. And so Agnes is Twitter baited. She's so excited to be recognized as a historian by this well-known historian at the time and also to be employed. She was so excited at the opportunity. Unfortunately, Agnes and Archie were not classified as um, relief worthy in Colorado. She did not qualify for the benefits of the Writers Project. So in other terms, they were not poor enough to qualify for the benefits of the Writers Project in Colorado. But as chance would have it, even though Agnes was crushed at not being able to accept that opportunity, one of her book proposals was floating around in the West at the time. And she had been working on several other projects. And just as chance would have it, one of her book proposals 
crossed a librarian's desk in Colorado and it sparked a conversation or, uh, in Wyoming and it sparked a conversation in Wyoming in Cheyenne uh, about her becoming the director of the Federal Writers Project in Wyoming. And so another call out of the blue, Agnes receives another amazing opportunity to be director of the Wyoming Federal Writers Project with the hopes that the guidebooks that she would put together would focus on women's history in Wyoming as her book proposal had suggested. And so they asked her to adapt her book proposal to fit the guidebooks for Wyoming and to move to Wyoming to be the director of their office. And this was an incredible feat for a woman to be put on a parallel scale at the time with her male colleagues, especially not having her degrees be in history and never having finished her grad program. It speaks to the level of research and the level of writing that she was able to put out. And so she and Archie temporarily moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where she oversaw the White Writers Project there and the team of researchers and writers in that office. And they were asked in the federal guidelines to complete one guidebook for the state of Wyoming that would eventually encourage tourism. And so it was to highlight specific towns and areas and the histories of those places, and also monuments and things that people could see along the way. So driving routes specifically that would encourage people to travel to Wyoming. And so Agnes completed the first book and they had so much, so many other things that she wanted to hit on that they ended up completing three books total. And Agnes was able to push the boundaries of the guidelines she was given to make sure that she focused on women's history in these books. She specifically did this by conducting research during business hours. So women were more likely to be home at that time when they were knocking on doors asking for oral histories of the area or of how their families like, came to that area or of legends or folklore about a certain area or place or time or event. And so Agnes was able to capture women's stories of um, communities that had not been studied in Wyoming before, specifically the Greek community in Wyoming was one that she hit um, as well as the indigenous population. And so Agnes was able to push those boundaries of the guidebook uh, a little bit and uh, well, more than a little bit actually. And she was able to create something that fit what she wanted to write, what the original book proposal that got her the job was, and also submit three books instead of one for the project. And so this was an incredible feat for her and also was a little bit of a turning point for her career as a historian because she was a self-made historian, but she also knew that she wanted to benefit women being represented in history. Um, and she saw this as an opening for her. And so after the Writers Project was dissolved in 1941, and after all three of those books were published by 1941, Agnes continued to write during the 1940s. She published three new books, and as well became a researcher at the Denver Public Library. And she was just kind of biding her time for that next opening, that next opportunity. And it showed up in 1950, when the state historian who was, pops back in, Dr. Leroy Hafen, needed someone to fill in for him as acting state historian while he accepted a year-long fellowship in California. And so he sought out, sought out none other than Agnes Wrightspring. And he asked her to fill in for her, for him, as state historian during the year that he was going to be away. And so Agnes accepted, and this made her the first female state historian of Colorado. And in Colorado, the position of state historian had been around for a little longer and now had had its own parameters, its own budget. And so in each state, the state historian is different. But in Colorado, the state historian oversaw the State Historical Society, as well as the State Museum. Now, those are both wrapped into one today, and they are under History Colorado at the History Colorado Center. But back then, they were separate, and they also included the job of being state historian also included a political aspect. And so for her to be the first woman on that stage at the level that the state historian had now reached as a position in the state was really important. And so as the first female state historian, even though she was acting state historian, Agnes accepted all of these duties. 
she focused on education and advocacy. And by advocacy, I mean advocacy for women to join the conversation. Every time they were hiring, whether it was for the research center or the library um, or the museum itself, Agnes made sure that women were considered for the position. And additionally, she made sure that women were included in the story, in the narrative, when they were collaborating for new articles in the Colorado Magazine or for new exhibits. And so she kind of started this when she was acting state historian and she would continue it later in her career. And I'll get to that. So when her year came to a close, when Dr. Hafen returned in 1951, the State Historical Society decided that Agnes had potential and that they wanted to keep her around. They just didn't quite know how. And so they created a position for her and she became executive assistant to the president of the Historical Society, a completely new position that restructured things and allowed Agnes to stay on board and continue to work with the programs that she had been spearheading during her year as acting state historian. Then in 1954, when Dr. Hafen decided to retire as state historian, Agnes was appointed as state historian. And so she would hold state historian again from 1954 to 1963, where she continued some of these programs that she had started earlier on. She continued her advocacy, and over the years, it would eventually change to not just advocating for women being part of the conversation, but also for accessibility across uh, racial and gender lines. Um, she wanted to, she maintained her goal that all students should learn history, and did this through um, increasing the accessibility of history education in classrooms. She talked to teachers and worked on curriculum. She worked on uh, history education and history curriculum being able to get into the classroom easier and into children's homework easier. She did this by appearing in television programs and radio programs where she spoke about new exhibits or talked about a historical topic and she would have teachers assign this as a homework assignment. And so students would have to tune in and listen to her and write something about it. And this is one way that she got into the school or into the home with history education. And on top of that, Agnes assumed the financial responsibility for these programs. She understood that it was the Historical Society's job and the State Museum's job to advocate for funding for history education, to prove to people that it was important. And so Agnes had to put herself in those political uh, environments, in those political situations where she was advocating for more funding for history education, while also remaining as politically neutral as possible, which was an interesting world for her to navigate. Another one of her programs was the Film Strip Rental Program, where she would take photos of an exhibit or of a series of artifacts from a collection, write a lesson plan to go along with it, and then teachers for a small fee could write in, write a letter in, and rent it out. Similar to the traveling trunk kits that History Colorado has today. It was kind of a precursor for that program. Um, and there were several film strip rental programs. And then later, as the technology advanced, there were also videos that you could rent. Um, short ones on exhibits or on a specific historic topic. Specifically, uh, I think the first one was on the fur trade, which is still a topic that students study in the fourth grade today in Colorado. She also appeared in television programs and radio programs, like I mentioned, and navigated those political and funding situations. Now, her overall goal in all of these things was to increase the level of accessibility for history education for all Coloradans and all Colorado students. But sometimes Agnes found herself having to uh, take up for the, the female side of things. Uh, in one example that I'll give to you, Agnes appeared in a radio program on KFG Radio with a host called Sergeant Y. And during the interview, Sergeant Y asked Agnes if she had any advice for the boys back home who wanted to write their own histories. And Agnes fired back, I think all students should read and write often to keep their love of history alive. And so there were ways that she subtly or not so subtly advocated for women to be included in that conversation publicly, as well as in the background work that she was doing through hiring and research and management of the collections. 
The last project I'll mention is the center of the screen, the gold nugget. Agnes's wish for students to love history and to want to get something positive back out of history education led her to create the gold nugget, which is a student publication. All of the articles within the gold nugget were written by students between second grade and high school age, so 12th grade. And she would help them research, she would help them edit them, and then they would publish a series of them. Um, and I'm not really sure the selection process for how she chose which ones got to make it into the publication, but it was an incentive for students to study history and write about it and, um, and want to excel in that. Agnes was not just an advocate of women being part of the conversation in history. She was an example of it. Throughout her career, Agnes wrote 500 plus articles that were published in different ways, magazines, um, you know, academic journals, or through uh, like actual publications like a book. She also published uh, 22 books and, um, and always maintained her her drive for putting new history research out there. She also navigated some interesting situations being the first female state historian. It was assumed that the state historian was a man. And yes, she was the first, so there was a little bit of a learning period for a lot of people. Even though she was reported in directories as Mrs. Agnes Wrightspring, state historian, it was, um, it was assumed that she was a man every time she was addressed not in person. And so in letters and over the phone and in press release uh, requests, she was addressed as dear sir, to which Agnes always corrected them as I found combing through archive boxes and seeing all of the letters that she left behind. Um, Agnes would politely correct them and stand up for herself, um, proving that she, who she was. Um, it even came from the state capitol, some of the letters addressed to her from the capitol building as dear sir, which was a format of the time, but also if they knew that she was a female, it was a little bit rude, I would say. So she stood up for herself in what she would later describe as a man's world. And during her time as state historian, Agnes realized not only that she was fighting for equality in different ways for women, but that also her life embodied some of those challenges that she was trying to help other women over. Um, and she would later start to be defiant about the things that she had overcome in her later years and in the speeches she would give. Um, she, she would mention that she never missed an opportunity to show or to tell people about what grit it took to make it in a man's world. And so that is a very brief synopsis of Agnes's life. There are so many other things that I wish I could talk to you guys about today. Uh, the next thing I just wanna leave you with are some next steps for my project. As a fellow, one of the things I wanted to take on was creating um, and telling a comprehensive story of Agnes's life. And that process led me across state lines, just like Agnes moving back from Wyoming to Colorado and back to Wyoming and Colorado. And in several archives and libraries and about a hundred archival boxes later, I feel like I have a really good take on her life and who she was. But something that was missing was her personal aspect, her personal story, because the artifacts in, and um, archival materials that she left behind were letters and official documents, things from her being state historian or state library. And, and um, I wanted to find the personal side of Agnes, who she was. And so I interviewed uh, Maxine Benson, who was the female state historian of Colorado, who followed in Agnes's footsteps and who was mentored by Agnes. And Maxine described Agnes as an all business type lady, someone who knew what kind of hard work it took to get where she was. Um, and so I took that as kind of my mission to show how she got where she was and where she got to at the end of her life and her accomplishments. And I wanted to set aside the confusion, because as I mentioned when I got started, there was confusion about when she was state historian, because 
she was acting state historian first, and she wasn't reported during that year because it was technically Leroy Hafen as state historian, even though she filled in for him. There was just some confusion about her dates, and therefore I think that it turned people off to researching her or reporting her in that history, the institutional history and the history of Colorado in general. And um, so I wanted to set aside that confusion and tell a comprehensive story of all of her experiences and the influences she had on budding historians at the time. I also wanted to connect her to the National Women's Suffrage Centennial because this is um, an, an amazing year to celebrate that. And I wanted to have an opening to tell her story to a wider audience while also showing what an influence that had on her life. And how we could be um, charged by her actions and by the centennial, as I know that I have been refreshed by celebrating the centennial. Next steps for the project, I hope to submit her our application for the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. And I also created a pop-up exhibit on Agnes's life and career. So as you see in that picture, that is actually inside the Center for Colorado Women's History, where it's standing. Um, and it is available to be rented out for free. Um, you can get my contact information through the Center for Colorado Women's History if you'd like to have that in your organization or your school. And so the last thing I'll say, and I'll leave you with, is a quote from Agnes. During my years in public life, I always worked harder than my staff and tried to justify the confidence placed in me by the nine governors whom I served regardless of politics. I thoroughly enjoyed my work for more than half a century in a man's world. Or since I worked in Wyoming and Colorado, perhaps I should say in a women's world too. And so now I think we will open it up for questions. If anybody has anything, and like I said, this is an abbreviated version of her story. So there is a lot more details that you can learn if you are interested. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kaylin. That was a beautifully well done presentation. And I hope it, like me, it leaves me wanting a lot more to learn about Agnes Wright Spring. But I do have a couple of questions here. Um, one of the first ones was going to be one, is your uh, thesis available to be read? And are there any other resources you can recommend? Absolutely. Um, so my thesis is available through the Auraria Library, as well as I have linked it on a website that I created when I was a fall fellow. Um, and we can potentially link that in the chat or when the recording of this video comes out, we can send it with it. I don't know what the correct answer is there, Michael. The link to the website. Yeah, what I'll do is anyone that did register on here with their email, I will be able to send you a follow-up email and I'll just make sure I get that information from you, Kaylin, if that works for you. Sure thing. Yeah, so that awesome. will be available if anyone's interested in that. Perfect. Um, but then um, Sandy here says, did Agnes have any children? So Agnes and Archie never had any children. They both wanted to focus on their careers and they supported each other in that. And so that's something that I wrote about in my thesis about how she just had a different mindset than a lot of the women at her, of her time. It was different for a woman during the 1920s to get married later in life and to pursue her education before she got married. And I always love to point out when people ask that question that Agnes didn't marry later because she didn't have any suitors. Agnes was actually quite popular with the boys. Um, she even had one suitor who uh, was still in love with her later in his life, and when he passed away, he left her $100,000, which she donated to the State Museum. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, but also, Sandy asked, did she keep a diary? So Agnes, if she kept a diary, she did not donate it with the rest of her resources. She was so judicious with what she left, and it was clear that the resources that were left and donated by her um, that she had combed through them for personal things. There were very limited resources on uh, like insights into her personal experiences other than there are digitized oral histories from the uh, state archives in Wyoming that you can listen to online. And that was one of the ways that I gained my insights about her life. And, but it's also important to remember that those were recorded later in her life. And so some of the memories might be a little off. And so I, I verified all that information that she was talking about with other resources. But it's nice to hear her talk about her own experiences in those. Oh, for sure, that's always a great resource. And um, another question here, when and where did she die and where is she buried? 
So Agnes is actually buried um, in Wyoming with her family, I believe. And um, she died in 1982, I believe. Let me find that. I believe it's 82. Awesome. And then I have a couple of things saying here that this was a fabulous presentation from Leslie and she definitely suggests that you write a book. But then the other question is, will your work become a book? <laughs> um, if there's the potential for that to happen. Um, after I finished my master's program, I kind of took a short break off of it. But now I have continued the research and um, there's so much more to learn. She spent a brief year in California for some reason that I would love to go figure out. Um, there's just so many things about her life. At one point, she was the headmistress of a school in Tennessee. And so there's just some little like spurts of her life that I have not covered that I would love to and that aren't covered in the archival resources that are within Wyoming and Colorado. Awesome. And then on that note as well, um, we have someone wondering if you did interview any extended family, nieces or nephews or later generations, if that was uh, um, available. So we do know that she has a nephew and that um, that nephew lives, I believe, in Grand County, Colorado. And um, he has a lot of the first editions of her books. So if, if anyone is interested in Agnes's works, uh, the 22 books that she's published, many of them are hard to find. And if you do find them on an eBay or an Amazon.com, they're extremely expensive because they're out of print. And we know that her nephew has first editions of almost everything that she's written. Um, and so it would be great to connect with that family, um, but I have not yet. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you got more you can do if you're willing to pursue it, right? Yes, That's awesome. All right. Well, again, if anyone does have any more questions, we will be keeping a look at the chat as well as the Q&A feature, um, but we're getting lots of good compliments, Kaylin. Uh, Carolyn says, thank you so much for this profound information. You are clear, articulate, and easy to listen to. And I will agree 100% on that. Uh, what a lovely, well done um, presentation. So that being said, I'll go ahead and share some information um, about future lectures. But just to really quickly, so you will be able to be contacted for that pop-up exhibit, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Um, it was supposed to go to the Molly Brown House at some point, and it was also supposed to go to a few high schools in March and April. Um, but unfortunately, those uh, tours of the exhibit were canceled due to the virus, but we are rescheduling. Um, so if you'd like to get it on the schedule, please contact me and I'd be happy to meet you with it and help you with the setup. It's easy and cubicle, so it fits almost anywhere. Yeah really beautiful exhibit so thank you for your work on that and your work as a fellow um now i have another question that popped up here now we have heather wondering can you say more about her husband as a possible supporter and how women were included in the wyoming federal writers guidebook absolutely so I actually have not found any photos of Archie, which really disappoints me. I do know that he supported Agnes in her writing career. He wanted to maintain an environment where she could pursue her research. Um, and so when she was actually, they moved to Fort Collins temporarily while she was working on a book so that she could be closer to the subject that she was interviewing. Um, and so I know that he was supportive of her lifestyle and that she supported the quiet lifestyle that he wanted. And in one, one instance where I've talked, I've, I've read about her talking about their private life. It was later in their life. Um, and it's a story that just to me shows a love that was there that I, that I can't find anywhere else on paper, but that I want to believe was there. Um, and it's a story that when Agnes was sick, um, she was, you know, freezing cold. She had a fever. She had like three jackets on and it was the middle of summer. <laughs> Uh, that Archie turned on the heat for her in their apartment. They never actually owned a house in Colorado, in Denver. They um, lived in an apartment and Agnes took a cab everywhere. She never learned to drive. Um, she had three coats on and he turned on the heat for her. And the story was her telling that he would not admit that he was warm, that he was hot, even though he was sitting by her bedside sweating, just buckets. Um, and so I found that like a really cute anecdote um, that to me describes a love that was there between them and a support for each other, but that I haven't been able to find anywhere else on paper. Awesome. Right. Oh, and she asked about the guidebooks. I'm sorry, I forgot yeah. to answer that side of the question. 
What was the part about the guidebooks that you would oh, like sure. to? Yeah, let's see here. It said, um, and how women were included in the Wyoming Federal Writers Guidebook. So please clarify if needed, Heather, but yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Um, so a lot of the oral histories that were gathered by the researchers and then later incorporated into the guidebooks um, came from women's perspectives. And so through that way, women's voices were able to be heard. And like I mentioned, Agnes made sure that the research was conducted during the day um, when a lot of women were more likely to be at the home. And so it's often that when the researchers would go and knock on a door, that the man of the house would be away at work. Um, and it's very possible that the woman of the house was also away at work, but, but it was more likely at that time in the 1930s for the woman to be home and um, would share her point of view, her perspective and her histories, which often were, uh, you know, illuminated her family's history rather than her husband's family's history. And so that was an interesting insight that Agnes made sure to include. Awesome. Well, this was great. And, oh, we got another one. Let's see. Uh, Heather also says, can you possibly give an example of what showed up in the guidebook? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on the one that is um, focusing on legends and folk tales. Um, there were several women who shared their families, um, basically like coming over stories and um, that had been romanticized. And Agnes thought that those had value in sharing those family traditions of storytelling um, that basically acknowledged the family's heritage and the, the woman's heritage that so often is left out because when you get married or when you got married at that time, you often kind of assumed your husband's traditions, his religion, his, his family's side of things. And so for a woman to be able to share her family's stories like that was really great. Awesome. All right. So for the sake of time, we're going to move on here. Oh, let's see. You know, we do have a question on, you know, would it ever be possible for the Molly Brown House to do a publishing run of Agnes books? That's definitely not something I can answer, you know. I, yeah. That's something I cannot answer, but that I would be interested in if it ever comes about through any entity. Um, I think awesome. uh, a lot of her books, I think people would enjoy several of her books as well as some of the uh, historical fiction that she wrote for a couple Western romance. Um, magazines uh, that I think could be made popular today if they were reprinted. That would be fun to see those around again. <laughs> All right, and speaking of the Molly Brown House Museum, I'm gonna go ahead and switch it to my screen here. Now, thank you so much, Kaylin, and lots of compliments on how well done this was. And I do have someone excited about the pop-up exhibit as well. So I threw my email in the chat. You're all welcome to email me and I will forward you to the uh, to Kaylin to find out what we can do. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that being said, our next talk is actually going to be on July 11th. So I believe three weeks from now. And it is the director, Andrea Malcolm from the Molly Brown House Museum, coming to speak about uh, Mrs. Brown and the vote. So I hope you can join us uh, at 1.30 on July 11th. Um, and I will be sure to um, put that in the chat as well once I get a chance. Um, but on that note, thank you so much, Kaylin. Happy summer, everyone. Um, and we hope you have a great weekend. All right, then hang tight, folks. I'm going to put that in the chat. And again, thank you so much, Kaylin, um, for all of that. Thank you. Mm.